Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you all and to welcome you to today's Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of science and exploration and wonder to change our world. The heart of our National Geographic community is of course our National Geographic Explorers. Our explorers are cutting edge scientists, amazing researchers and powerful storytellers. These Explorer Classroom events we run connect students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, in addition to all of our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for another great Explorer Classroom. But today, we're very lucky to be connecting with Brian Fuma. Brian is an ecologist, an adventurer, and a photographer. He studies how forests are changing as global temperatures rise. In just a second, he's gonna teach us all about his recent expedition to the world's southernmost tree, how it feels like the edge of the earth. But before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by a bunch of students today, and we have over a thousand more students registered to watch online. I'm so glad to have so many of you watching today. And I'm so glad that you represent so much of the world. Today we have groups joining in from Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, Washington, D.C., and Wisconsin. So basically what that means is that if you know anyone in Nebraska or Ohio or West Virginia or Wyoming, you need to get them here. I'd love to hit all 50 states. That would be so much fun. But we also have folks in Algeria and Austria and the Bahamas and Belgium and Bosnia and Canada and Ireland and Mexico and the Philippines uh, and the United Kingdom joining us today. So it is lovely to have you all here. And that's now plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Brian for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. All right, thanks so much for uh, attending today. It's an honor to come talk to all of you um, to bust into your, your classroom um, classroom at home or classroom in your classroom or classroom wherever it is these days. Uh, and I'm really excited to share um, what we've done. Um, let me get this, oops, let me get my screen share going. All right, is that good? It's perfect. Okay, um, so I'm Brian Buma, and I wanted to, again, say thank you um, for attending and listening. Um, it's, it's amazing how many people are here. <laughs> and I also want to say uh, I'm excited to be here at the beginning of Earth Week. So this is the 50th year of Earth Day celebrations, 2020. So this is Earth Week. So it's, it's a, a great time to be excited about the world, even when you're stuck inside. And I hope this... Um, this uh, story gets you excited about science, exploration, and really the world at large. Because even when many of you and all of us really are stuck inside, there's a ton of stuff you can do that's cool for science that you can do online now, and then plans you can make for when we can next go, go outside. So I'm going to tell you about a recent expedition of mine um, to the end of the world. That picture you're looking at is the southern tip of South America. Uh, I did this uh, as a National Geographic Explorer, and I also am faculty at the University of Colorado and affiliate at the University of Alaska. So let's, oops. there we go. Okay, so a bit about me. Uh, I love trees and forests. Um, I grew up in that part of the world right there, Northwest uh, United States. Uh, and then I lived for a long time in Alaska, and now I'm in Colorado. But um, this is a map of trees around the world and all of you live near trees. You may live in dense forests, you may live in um, dense cities, but you all have trees somewhere nearby. And today we're gonna talk about trees way down there at the southern tip of South America. So trees are cool because they seem so solid and so permanent. They seem like they never change. These are the trees where they look like where I grew up. Um, these are Sitka spruce trees. They're absolutely gigantic. Um, they can be six feet across, two meters across. 
uh, or more, and they can be 60 meters tall. They can, they're just gigantic things. And they seem really solid and permanent. So they're really um, uh, inspiring and, and um, just something to see. But the fact is they change a lot. Uh, my main focus of my research is how forests and trees change in response to things like natural disasters or people. So things like fires or wind or logging. Uh, and that's what you're seeing here. So this is a map of the world. And every time you see a color, that's actually a tree that's uh, either died uh, through like a fire or it's regrown. So, so forests, even though they seem like they live forever and stand forever and are really solid, they're actually changing all the time. Um, this is a, I do a lot of work in fires and this is a fire I was in last summer. This is in Northern Alaska. You can actually still see the smoke in the background. This fire was so hot, it burned um, a foot down into the soil. This is charred, charred dirt and charred plant material um, from this wildfire in Alaska. And, and wildfires are one way in which forests change um, really, really fast in response to climate change. You can still see some smoke in the background because it was still burning. Another place I work is, uh, another place in Alaska is that's changing is um, this area. You see a lot of dead trees here, but you also see a lot of trees coming back. This is an area where um, the forest is changing because snow has gone away, because the climate has warmed up. This place used to have snow all winter and now it doesn't have snow at all. And so all these dead trees are because of that. They're actually, um, the ground is freezing because there's not enough snow on the ground. And so we're seeing big shifts um, in the types of trees that we find, even in really remote places. This place is, uh, you know, 50 miles from the nearest person. You have to fly a float plane in to get here. But today I'm going to talk about um, tree line, because one thing I really like is finding the edges of things, finding the limits of things. And since we're talking trees today, that seems, that seems appropriate. So this is tree line in Colorado. So this is um, about almost 4,000 meters above um, sea level or about 13,000 feet above sea level. And this, you can see trees sort of in the middle there. You can even see some mountain goats there on the left. This is an area where it gets just too cold in the winter to support trees and so the trees stop. And the reason tree line is an important thing to study and the reason it tells us a lot about climate change in the environment is because tree line marks that point on the earth uh, where this particular type of life that's so important to us, trees and woody, um, tall woody things, um, are limited by something. And, and so once we know what limits them, we then know how they're gonna change as the climate warms up. It's also just a really cool thing, right? It, it shows us how the world changes um, as it warms. This is a picture from Wyoming, the mountains of Wyoming. Um, in the United States. And in the background, you can see is in the top pictures from 1929. And in the background, you can see there's not a lot of trees. And in the middle ground there, there's none. But by 2012, the trees have moved in quite a bit. And we think this is a combination of le less fires over that time period, but also the warming climate. So they're just really neat little signposts or big signposts to tell us how um, climate and the earth are interacting and growing and changing. So the story today is what and where is the world's southernmost tree and tree line? Because there's got to be one, right? Like as you move towards Antarctica, there's no, there's no trees down there. So somewhere there must be the last tree, the edge of the world, so to speak, um, the, the southernmost limit of plants. And it seems like something we should know in 2019, but we didn't. Uh, so this is, an ex uh, this is an expedition we undertook in 2019 to really fill in a big hole in the map. Um, this is a map of um, studies of tree line. And what you see is there's not much in the Southern hemisphere at all. Um, and, and so we wanted to know what, what's going on with trees down there? Where's, where's the end of the world, so to speak? And, and what, does that, what does that tell us? Now there's a reason so few people have explored um, the Southern hemisphere and especially the, the far reaches of islands in the Southern hemisphere. And that's because it's a really harsh place. The Southern Hemisphere um, is incredibly stormy. It's the stormiest place on the planet uh, in, in many ways. Uh, wind just whips around the planet down in these latitudes. Storms go uninterrupted uh, all the way around the earth. And so sailors called these the furious, uh, uh, roaring 40s, furious 50s, and screaming 60s. Like this, this is not a pl good place to be a to be a boat. <laughs> and it's a hard place to be a tree, as you'll see. 
So it took a lot of archival research, but the team and I figured out that the best place to look for the southernmost tree was um, this little island called Isla Hornos which is uh, the southernmost islands in the area known as Cape Horn, which you may have heard about. Now, Cape Horn is literally the end of South America. It's as far south as you can go before you fall off the map. You, uh, you fall right off in the map into what's called the Drake Passage, and then there's nothing left but Antarctica. So there, these are a bunch of other islands you're seeing here around. These are islands we all looked into to make sure there was no trees on those islands. And then we ended up focusing on Ila Hornos because that was the one where, where there should have been, or should be, um, should be some trees. So with that, and with the support of National Geographic, we took off for this little island. So this little island, as you can see in the upper left there is, as I said, located on the southern tip of South America. And to get there, it's, it's a long ways. We had to fly to the other side of the world from where we were, um, take a boat, from this town called Punta Arenas, take a boat um, through some pretty gnarly waves out through um, the, the Strait of Magellan and then out to the outer coast of the Pacific and then down the Beagle Channel to this very little town called Port Williams. And then we had to get on a littler boat and take the littler boat out to the edge of the Drake Passage and Isla Hornos. And this, this map here you're seeing is called the Wollaston Archipelago. It's the last archipelago in South America, essentially. There, there are a couple smaller islands, but this is the last uh, major group of islands. And then Cape Horn there is the furthest south bit. And before I wanna go, before I go any further, I just wanted to make sure to emphasize like all exploration and really all science, this is a team effort and it's a big team. This picture doesn't cover the whole team. This picture just covers the people that were in this picture. Um, there was a good 20 or 30 people involved that helped in one way or another. And that's the way to accomplish this sort of science is to um, make good friends and make good colleagues to go do this work. Um, we had a great crew of scientists and journalists, as you can see here. We had great captains, um, great, um, great boat uh, operators, uh, a great crew. Uh, and they were the ones that really got us to this little island in the edge of the world. And it was, it was gnarly. I don't think you can hear the sounds, but the day we landed, uh, the winds were just were picking up from just windy to really windy, and we had to hike back and forth from where we could hire, uh, from where we could land the boat to where we were camping. We hiked back and forth two or three times. It was a three-hour hike or so, and we did it in 40 to 50 mile an hour uh, winds, unfortunately. So it was very, very. Uh, it's a difficult place to walk around. Wind really rules everything on this island, but it, it makes a really what we call a heterogeneous landscape, a really variable landscape. You get things like exposed rock, uh, rocky highlands. Um, you can see me and in the back, of, right, right next to that big triangular rock there, you can see somebody in green. That's uh, my friend and colleague, Andres Holtz. These are huge, huge outcroppings and nothing grows on them because it's so windy. You also get heath uh, and tussock lands, um, lots of heather sorts of species. You get lots of standing water because stuff can't grow above the water. It's too windy. Um, you get beautiful, beautiful pocked landscapes like this. I, we brought along a botanical team and they looked for invasive species and they didn't find any. This is one of the few spots on earth where you don't find any invasive species. But you do find a lot of penguins. We have Magellanic penguins in the back and a king penguin in the front. You find a lot of predatory birds. This is a Karankara or, or sometimes called the Carancho too. This bird actually feeds on penguins. So it waits for penguins to fall and get trapped in the rocks. That's how it, that's how it eats penguins. They have things like the Andean condor, which is one of the biggest uh, birds I've ever run into in real life. It was absolutely gigantic. Uh, and they uh, can hunt small rodents. Um, and they do that by hovering on the, on the wind. <clears throat> And it's always windy. <clears throat> Cape Horn is one of the top 10 windiest places in the world. Um, the average daily max wind speed is 51 kilometers an hour and winds are greater than 72 kilometers an hour. So 40 or 50 miles an hour, somewhere in there, about 10% of the time. So it's always windy. Uh, we actually lost one tent and that was actually a small miracle. We only lost one uh, because winds surpassed hurricane strength for several days in a row while we were there. So we were constantly getting flattened by 80 mile an hour winds. 
but there are trees and they're really cool trees. I had never seen trees like this. I mean, you can see from this image how twisted and gnarly they are. They're, um, they're fairly tall, as you can see, there's, this is a, 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 John Harley is climbing a tree so you can measure the height of it. Um, they're about four to five meters tall, but they grow in these weird sorts of Dr. Seuss-like tortured angles and, um, and directions and all that sort of jazz. Um, probably because it's so windy. So when wind gets into the canopy, it pushes them around, it breaks branches, um, and it results in these really cool shapes. Sometimes they even just lay on the ground. Um, this is a tree that's actually about three meters long, but it doesn't even grow above the ground. It's just crawling around along the open space because where it is is so, so windy. Now we were looking for the southern most tree, right? Not just tall trees, the southernmost tree. So we took a boat and we actually had a lot of climbing gear, ropes and those sorts of things as well. And we explored the southernmost space of, space of Cape Horn. So this, this will start over. So that's the southernmost base of the island and there's no trees on it. We looked every which way, we got up close in the boat, we looked from the top, we climbed it um, and there's no trees there. So we knew that we could look north of that spot to find the southernmost tree in the world. And we eventually found it. It's not much to look at, I, I'll, I'll just tell you that. The, the, the big tall twisted trees were in very protected areas but if you wanna find the true southernmost the southernmost one, it's this little shrubby thing. Um, it's, it's actually quite tall if you stretched it out. It's about four meters long. It's like 16 feet long, but it only grows about the height of your knee above the ground. It grows up that tall and then it just grows sideways because again, it's super, super, super windy. But this is it. This is the southernmost spot, the video zooming in on it. And so if you go to that spot on Google Earth, that's where trees end. That's the last tree on the planet as you move south. There is none further south. We're pretty confident with that. It's pretty neat. So like in this picture, that's Andres and I again, and we're standing to the south of the southernmost tree in the world. Uh, behind us is nothing. In front of us is all the trees on the planet. Behind us, Antarctica, ice. So it's not tall. You know, it's not, it's not this big majestic thing overhanging a cliff but it's, it's, it's a really powerful signpost all on its own because we know now how far south trees can actually exist. We know how far and in what climate conditions trees meet their end um, in, the southern, in the southern hemisphere. And not just these short ones, of course. Um, you know, we have these taller ones too. And these are only about 100 meters to the north. Um, we know now uh, they can grow that tall and that southern tree line in the southern hemisphere in this in this place on Ilo Hornos, the last trees, they're not really controlled by temperature at all. They're actually more limited by wind. It's just that windy. So I'll show you, this is the, this is the actual tree species, just so you know. So if you want to know what tree lives closest to Antarctica or what um, species is the furthest south, it's this. It's Nothofagus betuloides. So it's called a Koiwe or Magellan's beech or an evergreen beech. It's a deciduous, it looks like a deciduous tree. It's a broadleaf tree. So that means it's like, it's broadleaf like a maple, as you can see, but it actually keeps its leaves year round. So it's an evergreen tree. It doesn't lose its leaves. And it belongs to this genus, this group of species called the Nothofagus, which are only found in the Southern hemisphere. So if you haven't ever been down there, you probably haven't seen one. They're this cool group of species that evolved uh, after Pangaea, the supercontinent started to break apart. So they only evolved in the southern half. And so you find them in New Zealand and Australia and Chile and Argentina, uh, New Caledonia, and you can actually find fossils of them in Antarctica. But like I said, on that island, they're really just controlled by wind. So uh, it's, a, it's a neat thing to see because it tells us what climate change is going to do to trees down there, what climate change is going to do um, to the southernmost trees in the world. So this map you're seeing here, well, you're seeing wind patterns around the earth, but the map on the, on the right-hand side of the screen shows the, where the wind's coming from. That's that colored circle thing. And so you can see winds are coming from the bottom left or the southwest. And then the map of that black and white map, that's Ilo Hornos. And the black areas are showing you spots protected from the wind. And the white areas are showing you spots exposed to the wind. So the green dots are where there's trees and the brown dots are where there isn't. So what you can tell from this map, I, I hope, is that 
trees are only really found in those protected areas. You don't find trees in any exposed windy location. It's just too windy to be a tree. So when we think about climate change, normally you think about things getting hotter or maybe things getting drier or wetter, but it's also changing wind. So in the Southern hemisphere, the climate change is increasing wind speeds. Wind speeds are going up a little bit every year and they're also changing the directions of the winds. And so what that's gonna do is it's gonna change what part of the island gets blasted by wind and what part doesn't. And depending on how that goes, and this is still a very active area of research, so we don't, we don't really know the answer to this, but depending on how that goes, what direction the winds end up coming from and how intense they are, that might change where these trees are. That may cause some of them to die. That may cause other places to be good for trees. Um, so this is a, a, a nuance or an interesting um, angle associated with climate change that people don't really think about um, is, is changes to wind, um, not, just, not just temperature, not just rain, um, but changes to wind. And it turns out that for our true like winter, southernmost tree in the world, that's gonna be a bigger deal um, than, than temperature. So it is Earth Day, and I wanted to give you a couple resources. You don't have to copy down these, these web addresses, uh, and I can bring them up later if you want, but uh, because it is Earth Day on Wednesday and Earth Week this week, uh, you should take advantage. There's all sorts of cool stuff. So Nat Geo Kids has some resources. If you want to collect data for Earth Day, Earth Challenge 2020 is, it has ways to collect data for scientists. And then NASA is doing some Earth Day at home um, activities that are gonna be a lot of fun. So with that, I'll finish off and we can talk and chat and I can tell you everything. I have, um, I have some, some, uh, some of the gear I brought with me um, as well as some flags and things. And uh, I'm looking forward to chatting and hearing your questions and thoughts about the southernmost tree in the world. Brian, that was amazing. What a harsh journey. You literally had to camp in hurricane level winds in order to tell us the story. And I'm so glad you did. For all of our folks learning at home, we'd love to see what you're doing with this. Uh, if you do a follow-up activity, maybe from the family guide or from the educator guide, send us your work. Maybe you drew a picture or you wrote a story or you made a video. Whatever it is, please send that in to us. You can use Twitter, tag at NatGeoEducation, and use hashtag ExploreClassroom. That way we can make sure Brian gets a chance to see all of your amazing work. But now it is time for questions. So if you're watching online on YouTube, keep sending in your questions to us in that chat bar. I know some of you are already doing so. Awesome questions so far. You only need to send them one time. We're keeping track as they come in, so you don't need to send it more than once. I think you're great. And if you're up here on screen with me, get that nice loud voice ready. I'll tell you when it is your turn. Um, but our first question comes to us from Kid Conservationist. They noticed that tree that was laying on the ground. I did too. I, I said out loud, mood. Like, wow, that mood for sure. But um, they're wondering what that tree that, that grows across the ground and doesn't ever get up off of it is called. So that was another Nothofagus betuloides. So that's another southern beech. In fact, on the island, there's only three tree species uh, on the entire island. And we only found 45 species of plants, higher plants, so um, non-mosses and things. Uh, but there's only three species of tree on the islands. Uh, there's a Nothofagus betuloides. There's Nothofagus antarctica. So it's like two sister species, so to speak. Um, they're both Nothofagus. They both uh, have those small sort of um, diamondy shaped leaves. I don't actually have a picture of it, but I can show you something. Um, uh, and then there's a tree called Demry's winter eye, which I'll get to in a second. But so I have this to, I can show you. So when, I hope you can see that. When we, uh, when I went down there, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere and it's, um, it's not a good place to bring a computer <laughs> and electronics often break. And so you always want to have a backup. And so um, in my notebook that I brought with me, so this is a notebook I brought with me, I actually drew out all the characteristics of the trees and various species one run into. I have pages and pages of this uh, because we weren't entirely sure uh, what things would look like because we didn't know how, I mean, people hadn't really climbed, you know, gone to that particular area much. Um, so the Nothofagus betuloides, which was the laneover tree, that's the evergreen beech. This Nothofagus antarctica right there, it's got um, very similar shaped leaves. That one actually loses its leaves. And then there's this species called Demry's winter eye, which it's or canello uh, in the, uh, is the local name for it. 
it's it it looks kind of tropical. It actually has really long, um, long sort of broad leaves. Um, and actually, as a random fact about it, it um, was it got its species name from a Dr. Winters uh, because it people during the age of sail people discovered they could chew on the leaves and it would give them vitamin C to fight scurvy. That is amazing. We've got David Yu online who's wondering now that you've found the world's southernmost tree. You're going to go after the northernmost tree? So that's that's a great question. Um, can I share? I'm going to share my screen again, if you don't mind, because we know where that one is, actually. And well, we don't really know where the northernmost tree itself is, but we do know where the northernmost tree line is. And I can actually show it to you if this will go. OK, let's see. Let me get ahead to a slide I didn't include. Here we go. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, we got so it. This is, this is the northernmost tree line in the world. This is in the Tymir Nature Reserve in northern Siberia. And it's a lot harder to, to really nail down the true northernmost tree in the world. And that's because um, Siberia is huge. And so there isn't this natural spot to go looking for it. Uh, the southernmost tree was a little bit, in some ways, easier because there's not a lot of land down there. At the, at the latitude of Il Hornos, the world is 99% water. There, there's just not a lot of land, so it narrows down where you have to look. But in the northern hemisphere, it's, there, there's a lot of places to look. But the current winner, I should say, so we don't know necessarily for sure, but the current winner is the Tymir Nature Reserve in Siberia. Um, this is it. Um, the, so the northernmost tree up there is called a dahurian larch. So it's a conifer tree. It's got needles, but it's a larch. So it loses its needles in the winter. It's, it's a long ways north. It's somewhere around 75 degrees north. It's actually further north than the north coast of Alaska. So it's, it's a long ways up there. Um, but this seems to be the northernmost patch. It would be a lot of fun to um, to go find the northernmost single one up there, that's for sure. And I don't think that's been done. That's a, that's a good one. We'll have to do that. Well, I guess you've got your next project then. <laughs> Take our next question from an on-screen student. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah, your microphone's on. Do you have a question for Brian? What kind of data do you collect from the trees? Great question. So we collected quite a bit. Um, our main interest was the health of the southernmost forest and then whether it was expanding or not. So um, I didn't bring a tree core with me, but we, um, we cored the trees first to see if the trees, the bigger ones were older than the younger ones or if they moved, got younger as you went further south because a sign of warming would be that the trees would move further south uh, uh, with, with time. So the oldest trees, those big ones we were climbing were about 200 years old. But when you get to the southernmost tree in the world, it's about the same age I am. It's, it's uh, about 40 years old, it's 42. Uh, so it's a couple years older than I am. So, and all those southernmost patches, those little ones were pretty young. So the first question was, is it expanding? And it looks like our Southern boundary is younger than our central boundary. The, the second question was, are they healthy? So we, we, um, we looked at not only were they alive or dead in various places? And it does look like there is some dieback going on. We don't know why, but the edges of those big forests were typically dying. Uh, we also measured the leaves to see how much moisture they had to see if they were water stressed. So Ilo Hornos uh, is a fairly wet area, but it's so windy that not a lot of water makes it onto the ground. It just blows right off. And so if you don't have the the land where it's naturally draining, all those pools you saw were sort of down low areas. Anything up higher can be fairly stressed for water. So we also investigated that. And so we're basically collecting health on, on the trees and then whether they're expanding or not. And, and it seems like the southernmost forest is fairly healthy other than that strange dieback, which we can't really explain uh, yet. And then it does seem like the southernmost ones are younger than the rest. So if they survive and keep growing, we should see an expansion. Cool. Well, let's take our next question from Mickey, who's up on screen with us. Mickey, your microphone's on. Mm, what's the shortest tree that you've ever encountered? <laughs> the shortest tree? <laughs> um, I mean, that that's actually a good philosophical question. And, and you guys should think about this. Like. How tall does a tree have to be to call it a tree? I mean, it's, it's a legitimate question, right? And, and some people 
have defined the a tree as something that's two meters or more. So about my height or more, like an adult height or more. And sometimes people define it as three meters or more and sometimes five meters or more. Um, so the shortest tree is, um, you, could, you could say, well, it has to be that tall to call the tree. Now I wouldn't do that because we have places like Cape Horn where you see, you can have a really tall tree that's just bent over. Um, so the shortest trees you find are really the baby trees. And I do a lot of this. I do a lot of going into to wildfires and counting really, really small trees, um, like centimeter tall trees, just to see uh, how many trees are coming back after a wildfire, or after a windstorm. So the shortest trees I've seen are so small that to identify them, you have to use magnifying glasses. Like I have a magnifying glass too. It's <laughs> kind of fun. Um, it's called a loop. It's very small, but uh, we use it to identify trees in Alaska a lot. Very cool. We've got Matt S. online who's wondering what the coolest tree you have ever personally seen is. Ah, the coolest tree. Boy, I'd have to say my favorite tree is a tree I grew up with uh, when I was your age, which is the Western Red Cedar. I, I think that's the coolest tree in the world. It's a tree that grows on the Pacific coast of the U.S. and Canada. I think it's cool because every little part of it can be used for something. And it's a really unique tree to the ecosystem. So the tree itself, from an ecosystem point of view, lives forever. I mean, it, lives, it can live a thousand years or more, a couple thousand years. It's got a really unique chemical um, composition to it. So it resists decay. So it's sort of a unique um, chemical player in the ecosystem. But then beyond that, uh, indigenous peoples for thousands of years, they, you can strip its bark and you can actually make hats out of it, out of the bark that repel water. Uh, the wood can be bent into boxes that can hold water. The, um, the bark is also, um, can be uh, woven into string, which you can use to catch fish. I, I think it's the coolest tree in the world, but everybody's got their favorite. <laughs> well, let's go to Owen for our next question. Owen, your microphone's on. Um, so about like the journey there, was it like life-threatening? Because you hear like all these stories about these big life-threatening, like weird little expeditions. And was it like that? It's it's a da it's a dangerous place to be on a small boat. There's no doubt about that. So um, the reason Cape Horn is so nasty for boats is the ocean is about you know three four thousand meters deep, not too far away. It's very very deep, and there's a lot of energy in it. And then when it hits Cape Horn, it has to narrow down between Antarctica and and the Cape and South America, and it gets really shallow right by Cape Horn. So you get really really big waves, uh, waves that can be 30, 40 feet tall. Um, potentially in the Drake Passage. It can be a fair, it can be a very, very dangerous place. And it's actually one of the deadliest places in the world to take a boat uh, in Cape Horn. So yeah, we had some pretty intense waves. When we were crossing to the Cape, we had four and five meter waves. So like 16, 17 foot waves, which is a lot bigger than our boat. <laughs> it was a lot taller than our boat. It's uh, about the same height as the boat. It was, it was pretty bouncy. Um, it was a little rough. We were pushing the edge of the, of the limits of the boat. And then when we landed, the boat had to leave because the weather got so bad, it couldn't stay where we were. And so we were, we were marooned on that island, so to speak, for a while um, because it, the weather was too bad for the boat to operate safely. So it can be a you, it can be a fairly dangerous place. And so the key to you know, operating in those areas safely is to be flexible and work with the weather. So for example, we got there and we stayed there rather than stay on the boat because we knew the boat had to pay attention to the weather. And then when we left, we left a little bit earlier than I had wanted to simply because if we had stayed, we would have been stuck for another several days because it wouldn't have been safe for the boat to go again. So yeah, the, the storms down there are no joke. It's not a, it's not a pleasant place to be on the water um, a lot of the time. And so you have to be very, very careful and get a good crew um, that knows how to sail in those areas. Well, Brian, now that you told us about the itty bitty trees, we've got a question online about the biggest trees in the world. Keisha and her son are wondering what those are and where those are. Cool, yeah, so the biggest trees in the world are well, it depends on what you want to call biggest. The tallest trees in the world are the coastal redwoods in California, uh, in the United States. So those are the tallest trees. Um, they can be incredibly high. There's, 
there's always stories of trees that were taught that have been just as tall or taller in the past, but the verified tallest trees in the world are the redwoods in the coast. But just a few years ago, people found trees in the tropics, I believe it was in Malaysia, that are almost as tall. Like we're still discovering trees that are almost as big as the redwoods. Uh -huh. Now, if you want to go for like the biggest tree in terms of uh, mass, in terms of stuff, then you're talking sequoia trees also in California. California is a good place to be a tree. Um, in most parts of California, it's a good place to be a tree. Um, those are the biggest ones around. So they're not quite as tall as a redwood, but they get much, much, uh, much, much wider than that. Brilliant. We've got Melanie online asking another one of these philosophical questions. How do you tell that something is actually a tree, not a bush or a shrub? Are there distinctions that you look for? So No, so that's a great, great question. And people argue about this, so I don't have a good answer for you. Um, the, the definition of a tree um, can be functional. So this is the definition I usually work off of, which is, is the top of the tree a single stem? And then is it experiencing a different environment than the ground? Because the thing with the ground, especially where I work, which is usually high latitudes or high elevations, you know, where it's cold, um, the ground is warmer than the air. So because the sun heats up the ground. And so a lot of plants can survive really close to the ground. And what limits the tree getting taller, or what limits a plant getting taller is, is it starts to feel colder and colder, the taller it grows. Uh, so you could define a tree as something that is a, that is like a single stem and then um, grows high enough that it's basically just experiencing the atmosphere as opposed to the plant temperature. Uh, but there are, um, in the case of, of this, in the case of the southernmost tree, it was pretty easy because like as you saw on that picture of the tree growing on the ground, they don't really ever look like shrubs. They just look like trees in awkward positions, you know, all over the place. Uh, that can be harder though for some species. There are species like willows, uh, which can grow in sort of shrubby form. And then if the weather gets good, all of a sudden they turn into a really tall tree, like one will take off. And so then it becomes a little bit of a, how you want to define it sort of thing, um, which is why these sorts of arguments about the trees are kind of fun. It's because everyone can always um, make a good case for whatever they, uh, whatever they think is the coolest. Love that. An unexpected next step from debate team. Tree sign. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> awesome. Let's take a question from Savannah. Savannah, your microphone's on. How do forests in the southern hemisphere differ from forests in the northern hemisphere? Oh, that's a good question, too. So um, the first thing you'll notice when you go to the southern hemisphere is in, in many parts, anyway, the species are completely different. Um, so I, I forget where you're calling in from, but do you have pine trees near your house, Savannah? No. No, it's pine trees? All right. So pine trees are really common. And the reason I mentioned pine trees is because the pine trees are all over the Northern hemisphere, but they only barely even get close to the equator in one spot and they don't really go to the Southern hemisphere. And then in the areas, the pictures I showed you, the Nothophagus trees, they never get into the northern hemisphere. And so the, one of the biggest differences you'll see is, um, is the species are often completely different. Um, the southern hemisphere has these forests that have broad leaves, those big flat leaves, like you see you know, in deciduous forests around here, that never fall off. So they have evergreen broadleaf communities. Whereas in the north, we have pine trees and, and lots of conifers and things like that. But there are a few species and groups of species which do go across. So there's like relatives of the red cedar I brought up earlier that live in the southern hemisphere. They're called Alersae, and they're one of the oldest and biggest trees in the world. They're on the top five list. Um, so they're related to redwoods too. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. The structures tend to be the same. So you can go into a forest and it'll feel like a forest. There'll be lots of trees close together and there'll be some shrubs and it'll feel like a forest because that arrangement is really good. Um, that arrangement works well as an ecosystem. You have tall trees that get a lot of light up top. You have um, shorter shrubs and, and herbs and flowers that can, that can survive in the, underneath those trees. And so those ecosystems tend to form well, whatever the species are. So the structures will look the same, but the composition will be really different. The, the species will look completely, um, completely different. Brilliant. Well, let's take our next question from Miles in Oregon. Miles, your microphone is on. Okay, so um, 
was there any life like further from the tree like animals or plants or anything like that like um was there life on the island or around trees look different yeah like, like in the area i guess of the tree. sure like yeah the um one of the coolest things about life on that island is the penguins um so there are tens of thousands of penguins on that island and what they do is they they you know fish during the day and then they hop across those boulders and then they go waddling back to their burrows every night and they build their burrows under really tall tufts of grass and so it's very difficult to walk on that island and so you're constantly walking past penguin burrows and they'll jump out and bite you because they, they they're scared of you so you have these penguins that are biting you so that's kind of neat but as far as the forest goes the penguins are really interesting because they eat all this marine food, right? They're eating fish, they're eating crabs. That's a lot of uh, uh, nutrients that they're bringing in. And what do they do when they go on land? They poop it all out. And so you essentially have marine fertilizer getting transported from the ocean into the forest. And not just, not just poop, it's, it's nitrogen and phosphorus. It's these two elements which are often really limiting for plants, meaning the plants don't get enough of it. And usually that's what controls how fast they can grow. And so you have this weird thing where penguins are basically fertilizing the landscape around these trees. Now in, in many parts of the world where that happens, it can happen through salmon coming upstream and then, and then dying and getting moved into the forest. This place, it seems to be through penguin poop. So the penguin is the penguin poop seems to be fertilizing this forest, and that's one of the really neat ways in which the life life is interacting down there, um, in a totally unexpected way. Uh, it was a very very fun to see to walk through these big trees, and then you um, not big trees, but you know they're trees that are about that big around, and then see a penguin look at you from around the trunk, um, you know, trying to see what you're doing. <laughs> Wow, I mean, I know it's such a harsh environment, but that sounds a little bit magical. Let's it's take pretty, our next. You, there, were, there were times where we could stumble and fall in, in the places where the trees were a little bit shorter. This happened a couple times. It's it's a very rough place to walk because you can never see the ground, the, the grass or the shrubs or the heath is too thick and it's very uneven. So you're falling all the time. I mean, literally every third step you fall into your knees or your waist into a hole that you never saw. But every once in a while you'd fall into a creek bed you didn't even know was there like through the top of a thing and it would be blowing 60 miles an hour above the top canopy and you'd fall underneath the shrubs, the wind would die and there'd be a bunch of penguins staring at you like underneath the bushes. You know, they're just sheltering from the winds in their burrows and all of a sudden you pop into their world. It's no longer windy and you have a bunch of big birds staring at you. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty bizarre, magical little place. Wonderful, weird, and not graceful. I relate. <laughs> Let's um, move to Stephen and Kira for our next question. What is the most important thing a kid can do to help prevent global warming? Ooh, to help prevent global warming. That's that's big, and and so the that's it's a good question though, and the reason it's a good question is because the things you can do now will last for fifty or sixty or seventy years because you're changing yourself, and that's what the best thing we can do is change how we behave. So the best thing you can really do for climate change is start making habits that um, minimize your contribution to climate change. So start building habits in yourself that will reduce global warming in the future, because then you'll carry them on. And the rest of us that have all these bad habits from 20 or 30 years ago, and we didn't necessarily know any better, eventually we'll all be gone. And it'll be the people with, with the good habits um, going forward. And those are things like riding your bike instead of taking the bus, uh, uh, you know, not using plastic, using bulk foods rather than non-bulk foods, as much as you can anyway. Um, everybody's different. And so it's it's hard to ever give one single answer because everyone's in a different situation. So the best thing you can do is just figure out what it is in your life you can make into a good positive habit that you can actually do and then do it. And then 50 years from now, you'll still be doing it. And that will um, that will do more for global warming than you could do than almost anything the rest of us could do. 
Wow. Well, what amazing advice to end on. Thank you so much, Brian. This has been spectacular. Thank you to all of our students for their thoughtful questions. Everyone watching at home, be sure to check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at some of our next events. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, you can tune in for Wildlife Journalism with Gloria Dickey. She's going to take us start to finish through her recent reporting on sloth bears. That should be fun. Um, and students, nice and loud, I'm going to turn on all of our microphones. Before we go, let's say goodbye and thank you to Brian. Ready? Bye, thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Brian. Bye. Thanks so much.